of October. <laughs> and one of the first things I would have said, it doesn't form the basis of one of my 55, but wear sunscreen is uh, is one of those. And I didn't wear sunscreen this afternoon for the first time in quite some time. I had it on this morning, but I didn't choose uh, the way the day had run as far as jumping in the ocean and, and things like that were concerned. So uh, with respect for your time, uh, I'm going to set a one-minute timer for each of these lessons that I've learned, and I've also put them to a quote. You know me by now. If you don't, David Lee is my name. I'm the uh, founder and chief coach of Leeway Mind and Body Mastery, uh, which pretty much means we work with both the mind and the body. They say you need a... A healthy body will give you a healthy mind, but you need a healthy mind in order to make the decision to have a healthy body. And uh, the 55 lessons that I have learned over my 55 years on the planet obviously tie in very heavily with uh, mind and body. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a timer for myself so that I don't go too long past one minute for the first ones and then see how as we kick along and we will go from there. So first off, number one, it is not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. That's a quote by Abraham Lincoln. Um, now, when I say that, I think of things like hide-and-seek and paintball, where someone might have gone the whole game of paintball without actually getting any paint on them, or they spent the entire time of hide-and-seek and never got found. When I was a kid, I played hide-and-seek and i hide under here and they'd come in there and then I'd get up again and I'd run into another room. And in running into another room, I found myself less likely to be found. So the idea of saying it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years, is one thing about being safe. I don't say be reckless. Uh, but if you uh, are living a life where you're filling each day full of things and getting things done, it's going to be a long and memorable life. So that's Number one, moving on to the next. The next one is the world is a book and those who do not travel have only read one page. And that's a quote from St. Augustine. Now, my take on that is you've got to travel. Travel is one of those things, people who stay where they are and that's all they know, they have a very short-sighted view of the world. Uh, I call it you can even travel intranationally. By that I mean you know, talk to, to foreigners. Today I spoke to, to somebody, I don't know where they were from. I, I'm, imagining it's the, I'm imagining it's a South American part of the world. Uh, I live in Manly and we have a lot of tourists out, and people who live here from Colombia and uh, Venezuela and Brazil. And within that, I get to learn a lot about their culture and I get a lot of experiences with them. But in traveling and going and seeing how the world works, you broaden your horizons, you learn more about life and you make things a little bit more interesting in the way that life goes. My third lesson, mistakes are the portal, uh, the portals of discovery, James Joyce says. Now I say the first time it's a lesson, the second time it's a reminder of the lesson, and then the third time it's a mistake. I say to my children, you don't make a mistake, you learn a lesson. You do it again, then it's a mistake. You do it again knowing you're going to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else then it's either a crime or a sin. And for mine, I think, you know, the more mistakes you make in life, the more you are actually learning. I think we're too afraid to make mistakes. Perfectionists out there don't want to make a mistake. So in, in avoiding mistakes, they don't try. It's a bit like the hide and seek thing. You know, they don't, you don't make an effort to kind of do anything outside of your comfort zone and you're not going to make a mistake. The fourth one I have, the fourth lesson is, just do or do not. There is no try. That's from Yoda from Star Wars. Now, I think to myself, if you do, if you decide to do a thing, then just do it. You know, agree that it's the right thing to do and do it. And the the word decision comes from the Greek word incision, which means to cut. So if you decide to do something, you're either going to do it or you're not. In in not making a decision, you've made a decision not to actually do anything. So get on with things. Uh, do or do not. There is no try. As I say, there's no such word as try power, might power, need power, want power, could power, should power. It's willpower. You either will or you will not. Number five, do not wait until conditions are perfect to begin. 
The beginning makes conditions perfect. That's one from Adam Cohen. Uh, I, I, I say, you know, if you wait for every green light before you decide to go into the city, you're never going to get into the city because you're never going to get every green light. That is, of course, unless you decide to eat a bowl of cereal or in the case that you're a woman uh, or somebody who chooses to wear makeup, I should say, these days, you will never get a red light because you're trying to put your makeup on or you're trying to eat that cereal. So there is never going to be a right time. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Today is the day that you should start whatever it is that you want to start. Uh, you know, waiting for this, waiting for that, the toolbox fallacy. I was one of those people at one stage until I get my website, until I get my business card, until I get my niche, all that sort of business. It just keeps you stagnant. The next one is Pablo Picasso, quote, the meaning of life is the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give that gift away. I say to my, I say, you know, you have a gift. Everybody, everybody has been born with something that is unique to them. And you know what it is. It is your job to find out what that is. Uh, it's your job to find out who you are as a person and to find out why you were put on the planet. And then once you find that out, do that. Live that purpose to the best of your ability. Do it and teach other people. I, I, I think things like cadetships, mentoring, encouraging people, you know, speaking to the elderly, talking to them, helping them out, you know, doing favours for people. That's what, If that's what you, you've discovered that your purpose is in, other, in order to help other people or to learn things or to, to use the gift that you have that only you know you've been given, sure, other people have similar traits, but there's a gift that is unique to you and you know what it is and live that gift. Number seven, the best way to predict the future is to create it. That's from Peter Drucker. Now, I say plan all the way to the end with your destiny in mind. When I talk about your destiny, as I say, the D is do it now. The e is with energy and enthusiasm. The S is success is imminent if you trust the process. The I is in, it's inevitable if you never, ever quit that you will get what you want in life. Your destiny is going to happen because you are enough. And once you accept that you are enough, you can get on with things and live that destiny that you were born to live. Number eight, the greatest glory. Sitting this time where it's going well, I hope. Greatest glory in living lies not in ever falling, but in rising every time you fall. That's one from Nelson Mandela. I just say, get up, get up, get up. Muhammad Ali, I'll throw this one in for free. He said, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. You don't lose a fight by being knocked down. It's whether you stay down. You've got 10 seconds to get up. Those 10 seconds can be a very, very long time for most. <laughs> I always think if you're doing high-intensity interval training, you're doing 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, or Tabata training, it's eight lots of 20 seconds on with 10 seconds off eight times. There you go. 20 seconds seems to be a very, very long time, 10 seconds to be a very, very short time. The reality of it is keep getting up. The Kaizen theory, if that doesn't work, do something else. If that doesn't work, do something else. If that doesn't work, do something else. Next up, number nine, genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. People say to me, wouldn't it be great if we had a crystal ball? And I say, we do. They're called our parents. Some of us are lucky enough to have two. Some of us are lucky enough to still have parents alive. Some of us, some of us are lucky enough to see how their parents have matured into adulthood and into late adulthood. By that, I mean, my father was 85 when he passed away peacefully in his sleep a couple of years ago. Now, when I say crystal ball, you can either go, well, okay, that's what my father was like. I want to be like my dad. I have some clients when I say, tell me, why are you coming to me? They say, because I just spent the weekend with my mother and I don't actually want to turn out like my mother. I just do not want to be her. Okay, so what do you have to do to not turn out like your mother? Or what do you have to do to turn out like your mother or your father if that's how you want to turn out? Number, uh, we're getting through these, which is good, I hope. Uh, number 10, before machines, the only entertainment people really had were relationships from Douglas Copeland said that. Now, there was a poem that came out. It was a bit of an article, and I read it in an old Time magazine from probably the 70s. And it was called The Stranger in the Room. And they talked about the fact that their father brought home a stranger one day and he sat in the corner and little by little he started to swear a bit and 
tell them things that their parents weren't telling them. He was referring to, or the poet was referring to all those years ago about the television. Now, prior to machines, the only entertainment we had were people and relationships. We have actually given over relationships and people to this silly machine called the phone. It's great. It's great for a timer. I use it for that. But how much of relationships, even the developments of relationships and the ability to develop relationships, have we given over to the electronics of our world and prohibiting our children from learning those lessons ourselves? We worried about the television back in the 60s and 70s. Now I think we should be really, really focused on that. So people before technology. Number 11, all disease begins in the gut. Hippocrates said that in 350 BC. Um, I was walking this morning and, you know, walking with my stepson, Conrad, and my stepdaughter, Annalise, and we're talking about Pablo, this dog. He's a Havanese dog. Uh, Havanese is what it's called. And they were also talking about what they're going to do. It was Conrad's birthday today. And he's talking about the idea that he's going to go to McDonald's. He gets to go to McDonald's every year on his birthday, as does his sister. Now, with that thought in mind, I've got some ice here. I had actually said, I wondered, will we be able to give Pablo a, like a Happy Meal? Maybe they should make a pu McPuppy Meal. What do you think? And both children very quickly said, oh, no, no, no. Pablo can't eat McDonald's. I said, why not? They said, because they'll kill him. I said, what about chocolate? Knowing the answers. No, you can't give dogs chocolate. It'll kill them. Now, here's the thing. We give our kids foods that we wouldn't feed our dogs. You know, I mean, they're farm dogs and all that sort of thing, and they'll eat whatever. But we give our children things and we feed our animals better than what we feed our children. We think we're giving in. You give in to a dog. I mean, you read the, the books on how to care for these Pavanese and it's don't do this and don't do that. If you actually follow those instructions with your kids, you'd be a lot better off as well. Number 12. Bad men live that they may eat and drink, whereas good men eat and drink that they may live. That was from Socrates. Now, for mine, I say, you know, I go nuts one day a week. One day a week, I eat at least 8,000 calories. That day was yesterday. I, When I say far too much meat, it wasn't, wasn't enough. How do I like my steak? Right next to my other steak. Um, I then had dessert. I had cheese, all that sort of business. Now, I didn't eat all day long. Fasting is one of those things that... If I'm telling you the secrets that I've learned or all the lessons I've learned in the 55 years, fasting is one of the three determinants towards longevity. The longer you can go without food, if you can live off two meals a day or skip one meal a day, whether it's breakfast or it's dinner, you're going to actually live longer. You're going to feel younger. You're going to look younger. I've been fasting for I don't know how many years. Um, it's, it serves me well, but also the major benefit of fasting is excuse me, what is known as autophagy, and it mops up all the bad cells in your body. But I also believe the determinant of fasting towards longevity is the idea that you can go for all that period of time without eating, and that's discipline. And self-discipline is your ability to follow yourself. Number 13, complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation, St. Augustine said. Now, for me, I think disdain what you cannot have. Now, only recently, with these 8,000-calorie Burko days in mind, I've started eating ice cream again. Now, I was taught at a very young age, one of the lessons I learned is disdain what you cannot have. If you, if you can't have something, you have to hate it. Now, I was a fat little kid. When I say a fat little kid, I wasn't fat for all that long. I was, you know, we were, uh, you know, we were fed well. We, we never had a car, so we moved everywhere. So... You know, they used to call us the greyhounds because my mother would walk us all on these little sort of, um, what do you call them, stirrup things to hang to hang on to us when we were younger. Um, but the idea was that, you know, we didn't, I'm just trying to think of the, the quote now, that threw me back. Uh, oh, in order to, one year, the World Series cricket came out and I spent the sun, summer lying on the lounge watching cricket and not playing cricket. I got back to school. One of the kids said, Lee, you're fat. All of a sudden, potbelly Lee. And so I, I, and what I'd done was I was eating ice cream on the lounge. So in order to lose the put, I ran, lifted weights and quit, uh, quit alcohol, quit <laughs> ice cream and just didn't have ice cream for forever and a day since. And only recently I have started with Conrad and Annalise <laughs> eating this ice cream. And into, even you know, today I had some 
It's called Anita Gelato down here in Manly. Uh, I say delete the apps as well. Complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. If you're not good, if you can't handle the gambling, get rid of the apps. The difference between gambling and betting. You know, pornography on your own, get rid of the apps. Complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. If you can't moderate, go without completely. Number 14, let food be thy medicine. That's another one from Hippocrates. Now, he lived to the ripe old age of 92. So I'm going to put my money on his philosophy rather than all these people. Now, people go, well, there wasn't any processed food around in Hippocrates' day. Yes, there was. There is evidence of beer, tortillas, and, and other processed foods, 7,000 BC. Now, the difference between processed foods and preservatives is there's no numbers in processed foods. You look at the wrappers on the side of your cereal boxes or whatever it is you're about to put into your mouth, and then you wouldn't eat them if you saw how many numbers are on the side. Uh, with that, I'll say don't add salt to your meals. High blood pressure is one of those other determinants of good health. The biomarkers that they test you for is your blood pressure, your cholesterol, your heart rate, all those sort of things. I've got a blood pressure monitor in there. As I journal in the morning, I take my blood pressure. It's very happy to see on my birthday. This year it was 120 over 80. Couldn't, couldn't have been happier. If you are going to use salt, and I do suggest that you do this, you add Himalayan rock salt or Celtic sea salt, which hasn't been as processed. It hasn't been bleached and washed out of all the goodness. It's got 84 minerals. Himalayan rock salt has 84 minerals in it. Number 15 on that same theme, when a man slakes his thirst at the well, he quickly turns his back on it. 17th century Spanish philosopher, Jesuit philosopher, Balthazar Gracian said that one. Now, we all know we can go three days without water, but do we go three days without water in good health? So my thing is, well, you know, I don't, I didn't make this up. You need 30 mils of water for every kilo of body weight. If you can get 250 mils of water in per hour for the first 10 hours of each day, you're going to be well on the way. So 250 mils, this is 330 mils. So, you know, half of one of those or 75% of one of those. Filtered water is another one of those things. Have filtered water because there's a lot of toxins, metallics and things like that in there. Put one in. I say put a filter in. When you think about the investment, if health is your wealth, the investment in your health is your greatest priority and your greatest responsibility. Um, so put in a filtration system and always carry water with you. You know, I mean, for me, in the boot of my car, I have 24 bottles of water at any one stage. Um, if I get down to the, to, the, to the beach and there's no water, I go, right, I've got to get off the beach and buy some because otherwise I'm going to be sitting on this beach and all the way I'm going to be thinking about that and that's going to age me. When I say age me, it's going to give me something to worry about that I shouldn't be worrying about. Fix it, get onto it straight away. Uh, number 16, there may not always be time to do everything, but there is always time to do the right thing. Brian Tracy, on the, the, the feeling of looking after yourself, Protein comes from the Greek word protos of first importance. You need 2.2 grams of protein for every kilo of body weight. And if you don't have that, the only place your body can get the amino acids, which are called essential, because they are essential, those essential amino acids can only come from your muscle mass or your skeleton. So you're almost working against yourself. Now, net protein utilization. If you want to know the highest sources, eggs, uh, 98%. Fish is 89% chicken 85%, beef 82%, and lamb 80%, which basically means that 80% of a lamb's content, the net protein utilization, your body will utilize 80% of that from a source of protein. Next up, as long as you live, keep learning how to live. Seneca. Now, that just goes, when I say that goes without saying, you may have, uh, you may have heard me say that when I was eight years old, I asked my father, Dad, how old do you think you are when you die? He said, you die the day you stop learning. As an eight-year-old boy, I thought, well, hang on a second. Don't want to die. Learn, 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 learn. So as I say, as long as you live, keep learning how to live. Tonight's session is one of those. All of you who have tuned in or are going to watch this again on hashtag replay, put those things into play. Lessons, listen to it again, read it again, all those sort of things. The books that you read, read them over and again. Pick them up. Highlight the things that actually um, are, benefit, are beneficial to you in living your best life. Number 18, instead of buying your children all the things you never had, teach them all the things you didn't know. Knowledge wears out. Materialism wears out 
knowledge doesn't. That's Bruce Lee. Now, <laughs> excuse me, I believe it is every generation's responsibility to make the next generation better than they were. And that is by doing the things that you should be able to learn. Now, that you've learned rather, and teaching them. The other night, it was my birthday, and I walked into Hugo's. I was having dinner with my daughters, and they say you can't book a table out the front. And in my manifesting, I was going to sit out the front, and I planned it all, and I rang, and I even went in there, and I said, I've been coming here for 13, 15, 14 years. However long you've been open, can I please book a table outside? They said, no, sir, we don't book tables outside. I said, come on, I don't know. no, no, can't do, can't make any concessions. So I turned up the other night, and as we got there, I thought, great, there's about three or four tables with nobody on them, and you could have at least fit six people. Now I said, hi, can I have a seat outside? They said, no, you can't. And I said, well, hang on, you said you can't book. And they go, no, this lady got before you. And I said, how many people are with you? And he said, mate, we just, we can't. We've got a good seat inside for you. And I said, and I got cranky, and I was visibly cranky. And my daughters both said, come on, Dad, come on. And as they sat me down, they were telling me, oh, Dad, look, think about this and think about it. And then they rattled off about three or four things that I had told them over the years. And I thought, wow, thank you. And they they actually changed the channel. They distracted me. And it was only when I was ringing them the next day and thanking them. And I actually said, thank you also for pulling me up on my, my fixation on getting that outside table. I just I don't like unfairness. And I was responding. But to me, I thought, wow, in retrospect, since thinking about that, I thought, great. I've taught my my children the things I wasn't taught because I have a temper. <laughs> my father had a bad temper. I inherited that temper. He never taught me how not to have a bad temper. I've had to teach myself. Number 19, Joseph Schubert says to learn, to teach is to learn twice. Now, you may or may not have remembered the ad. I think it was an Optus ad. might have been a Telstra ad. The little boy says to his dad, Dad, why did they build the Great Wall of China? And the dad's driving away and he doesn't know. And he says... Uh, I was to keep the, the, the rabbits out. Yeah, there's too many rabbits in China. Now, the father didn't know, and in, in, in not wanting to be ignorant to his son, he made up a story. Now, the son may repeat that story as time goes on. My thing is teach your children how to learn and do it together. Uh, I might uh, This morning I was walking in and I was telling a story and uh, Conrad's 11th birthday, and he said, yes, I know, we're talking about... Uh, Annalise sneezed and I said bless you and she said why do you say bless you and I said well during the bubonic plague which killed a million people in the UK in, the, in London in the 1800s or 1700s whatever year it was and the year was irrelevant um, there was a plague and when people sneezed they thought they were going to die and Conrad said yeah I know I know I know this and I said okay tell me the story he was, and I said no no tell me the story now, it's my responsibility to teach a child who thinks he knows it all that he doesn't, and there's nothing wrong with that, and there's a confidence in that. But sometimes we kind of, we don't, we fall short on teaching children everything, and it's not our job to be our children, stepchildren, or anyone in our care's best friend. It's to be the best teacher, and that's one of those things that I've learned is that you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. But you have to teach the water how to get the horse how to get to the water, how to find that water, how to drink that water, and when it needs to know that water, and when to know when it's had enough or hasn't had enough. That's our responsibility. So teaching children how to learn. And in that, you learn yourself. Um, number 20, there is nothing I like better than conversing with old men, Plato said, for I regard them as travellers who have been on a journey that I may yet go myself. Now, my thing on that is just speak to older people. When I moved down to Sydney many, many years ago, I joined RSLs and RSL gyms because the beers were cheaper and the membership was only $5 a week. The bonus of that was that the men who frequented those watering holes and those gyms were generally in their 80s and 90s and they were telling me all sorts of stories. And I learned so many stories. They pretty much told me where the potholes were in life. They told me, you know, the ones who I wanted to emulate, great stories. The ones I didn't, hard luck stories. Loser stories, for want of a better word, I don't like that word. Number 21, Socrates, no man has the right to be an amateur in caring for himself physically and mentally. It is, it is what does he say here? It is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength with which his, his body is capable of. Now, for me, 
it's it's a daily surprise when I go, okay, wow, I did that, I did this, and people, oh, you look good for your age and all that sort of business, and, you know, thank you very much. But you can never rest on your laurels. You know, it's a, it's a combination of low-intensity, steady-state cardio, medium-intensity, steady-state cardio, high-intensity interval training, uh, running occasionally, walking most days, but calisthenics, body work, body weights, and using your muscles, building muscle mass, one of those three biggest determinants of longevity because your muscles are attached, you're, they're filled with your nervous system, and they're attached to your skeletal system. So learn what it takes to look after yourself. I, I, I kind of take for granted that people know what I know because it's always been an interest for me. But then I will send people workouts and they'll go, what is this? And I go, oh, okay, wow, I didn't realize that. Um, I have to talk you through that, but I'm happy to do that. And that's exactly what I do. Number 22, we do not stop playing because we get old. We get old because we stop playing. George Bernard Shaw said that. Um, I look at the 90-year-olds walking along the promenade down at Manly Beach. They didn't decide to start walking at 85. They've been doing that since they were either a nipper or since they were in their 20s. I mean, I think your cardiovascular system is pretty well set up to the peak it'll be between the age of 10 and 13. So it's, it's never too late. Even at the age of 25, up until about the age of 25, you can kind of get into it. Now, I don't think the generation that I'm from that we were completely ignorant to movement because we had to. You know, prior to, you know, DoorDash and all these things that happened so quickly, we did actually have to move and lift our game somewhat to get on, into the places that we've gotten into. So I don't think that's such a bad thing. But also the other point to that as well is just keep playing. You know, Aristotle said you'll learn more about a man in an hour of play than you will in a year of conversation. And I think it's that playfulness as well that just keeps us young and keeps us young of mind and of spirit. Number 23, the things which matter most must never be at the mercy of the things which matter least, Johann von Goethe said. Now, your health is your wealth. That to me is, you know, it's children to boys to men. And I think uh, if you, what is what does matter most? You know, and I ask the room and I'll say, okay, what's most important to you? Money, family, or health? And the older people will always put their hand up for health. You know, the people with children, middle age, say 30s to 40s, maybe to 50s will say family. And the youngins will always say money, 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 money. There is a, um, a Muslim saying there's no pockets in a shroud. I say to people, how much money did Kerry Packer leave behind? All of it. You ever seen a UPS truck in the midst of a hearse, uh, a funeral procession? No, you haven't. You can't take it with you. Your health is your wealth. That's where you should invest. Most of your time and money is in preserving your health. Prevention is better than cure. As I said, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things Wearing sunscreen is one of those things that is preventative rather than curative. Number 24, it's not the first or the last blow of the sculptor's hammer that breaks the marble, but every single one. Jacob Rees says that. For me, consistency is another word for persistency. When your partner says, can you open the Vegemite jar or the jam jar or whatever it is, she or they have loosened it somewhat in your um, doing the final twist, that's where you've actually helped her out. Similarly. It's when Thomas Edison said, I didn't fail 10,000 times, I found 10,000 ways it wouldn't work. And there are so many people who give up just short of hitting gold. Um, myself, there are times when I think to myself, oh, I think I'm just going to give up on this program. And it's like, no, 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 there's something you've got to tweak. There's something you've got to tweak to make this product something that people want to buy. And I'm, I'm convinced that the product is right and I'm also convinced I don't need to market something. It shouldn't be in the advertising, the marketing, or the selling of a product. You can't sell a secret, of course, but I fine-tune the programs that I come up with so much so that they deliver on every promise that I make. And so for mine, the idea of it's not the first or the last, well, it's not the first or the last idea or ideal that I put into any of my coaching programs, but every single one of them, every single component adds up. Every single word of my book, every single word of tonight's talk, is what will actually hopefully plant these seeds and mess messages and memories in your mind. 
Number 25. If you knew you had to save, if you knew you had to fight to save your life today, would you, t- tomorrow, I'll, I'll read it rather than try to remember it. If you knew you had to fight to save your life tomorrow, would you change the way you train today? That one's from Bruce Lee. Um, I say, you know, my brother's a policeman. It's on the wall of the academy when he was learning. If you knew you had to fight to save your life tomorrow, would you change the way you train today? And one of the things that I know is that when I'm in the gym and I'm just, I think, no, do one more set. Even if I hadn't planned it, it's the extra set that the growth is coming from. Um, I ran five kilometres on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday it was, Wednesday morning, for the first time in, uh, if you know or not, I had the back operation last year, two discs taken out in, in November, but I hadn't run because I wasn't able to run since probably June or July of last year. And I put 30, 30 minutes, I thought I'd be able to run five kilometres in 30 minutes, 10 kilometres an hour, and off I went. And as I started, you know, the little niggles, the mini-me and all this sort of thing, and I thought, no, I'm going to stick with this, I'm going to stick with this, I'm going to stick with this. And that's what I did. And I and I ran for 30 minutes. You know, my knees hurt up until about yesterday, and I won't make a habit of that. But I did it to prove it. And the point of that was I was... I often say, can you save your own life? Could you run five kilometres in under half an hour? Because you're generally going to be five kilometres to 10 kilometres away from help. Could you do 10 chin-ups to climb out of a burning building? Could you bench press your own body weight to push away an attacker? Could you deadlift your own body weight in order to lift your partner or somebody else out of the bush? Um, Could you dead hang from a bar for a, a minute? Those sort of things are the things that are going to save your life. And so change the way you train to know that you've left nothing in there. You know, don't be half asked the way you're doing things. Um, number 26, the best six doctors anywhere, but no one can deny it, a sunshine, water, air and rest, exercise and diet. Wayne Fields, little ditty there. Uh, what I say is multitask, combine them all. You know, if you uh, go for a beach run or walk along the beach and you walk with a friend, it's mental, it's physical, it's social, it's spiritual, financial, it doesn't cost you anything. Family, do it with your, your family, the kids. Jump in the ocean, you get the water, you're getting the sunshine, getting the air, getting the, you know, go and have a good night's sleep and you'll feel like it. I tell you what, I slept like a log the night that I ran those 5Ks. Number 27. It's not about being better than your fellow man. It's about being better than who you were yesterday. Ernest Hemingway said that. Now, when I say being better than who you were yesterday, or he did rather, when I ask people, how's their diet? And they say, my diet's pretty good. What did you eat in the last 24 hours? How did you move in the last 24 hours? What did you read in the last 24 hours? Who did you engage with in the last 24 hours? Who you are today has to be better than who you were yesterday. If you ate well yesterday, drank a lot of water, slept well, what could you do today to be better than what you were yesterday? And if you're ticking all the boxes, I have a very routine morning and a very ritualized evening. I'm always looking to tweak that and add something that makes me a little bit better than who and what I was yesterday. Number 28, comparison is the thief of joy. Eleanor Roosevelt said that um, there's always going to be someone older, wiser, stronger, smarter, faster. You know, comparing yourself down is going to make you sink. You know, compare yourself to the bloke next door, right? Yeah, you know, if he's not who, oh, yeah, I'm better than him. Well, and compare yourself too high, then you're, you're going to actually be going against yourself. So the reality of it is, just compare yourself to yourself. Again, it's a bit of a play, maybe an extension from the other one. Number 29, anatomy is destiny. Sigmund Freud said that. Um, I think, you know, obviously when people say to me, oh, you know, why would you want to live to 100? And I say, okay, well, if you could live to 100, feeling and with the same sort of mental capacity as you do today, would you have a problem with that? Well, no, I wouldn't. Well, you can. And it's called lifestyle. It's called looking after yourself. And it's what you did for those last 24 hours. When I call it the recency effect, effect, look at your recency. What have you done for me lately? That's you talking to you. It's a Beyonce song. But the reality of it is, what have you done for yourself lately? What have you done to look after you to make sure you get to 100? Is what you're doing right now the best use of your time? Now, right now, engaging in this uh, recording is the best use of your time, I would reckon. Number 30. All truly great thoughts are conceived whilst walking. That was a Nietzsche quote. Now, the running bit, as I say, was very taxing on me the other day. Um, And my doctor did say to me at one stage, you run every day, you may not be able to walk when you're 60. But if you walk every day, you'll be able to walk 
when you're 90. Now, what I've been doing yesterday, I actually, um, I've got a 30 kilo weight vest and I've got a backpack and I put a 10 kilo, uh, what was it, a slam ball in there. So I was walking with 40 kilos and I walked a good 5Ks from Balgala Heights downhill. Now, the point of that is I'm trying to work my muscles, the concentric. Now, eccentric means away, concentric is towards. The way I remember is eccentric is eccentric people are a little bit away from society. So using the muscles that are actually going to help me walk downhill is what's also going to help me walk downstairs as I age. Um, but it is low intensity, steady state cardio. Now, when I said I blitzed 8,000 calories yesterday, I had got up early. I'd done a boot camp and a boxing session down on Manly Beach, carried all that weight across. And then I did that walk from Balgala down here and I hadn't eaten. So by the time I did eat, which was 2.30, that 8,000 calories, whilst I went nuts, <laughs> excuse me, I had actually earned it. I'd fasted, but also because I'd done that slow walking. And I didn't do it with, pod, with, with headphones, so I had a lot of time to think about what I was going to talk to you blokes about tonight. You can be the judge on uh, whether or not uh, Mr. Nietzsche is... Correct, in that these are great thoughts conceived whilst walking. Number 31, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today. That's a Chinese proverb. Now, I just say begin it now. Now, take the first step. If you know that you want to do something, you're never too late. You know, when I even say to people, okay, you have always wanted that MBA. Do the MBA. Begin it now. In three years' time, you're going to be three years older anyway with or without the MBA. So do it now. Now, if you didn't plan it 20 years ago, you didn't do it, who cares? Again, if it's that important to you to have that certificate, but you don't want to go to night school or whatever, Google thegreatcourses.com. You can buy and listen to, and I've still got CDs, stacks of CDs on philosophy, psychology, now I don't get the degrees from those because I didn't get the I didn't actually sit and do those exams, but I sat through every single lecture that a university student would have done as a doctor in medicine in all these. I don't have the certificates. It doesn't matter. At any time, I can pick it up and listen to the philosophies of Saint Paul if I wanted to. So the point of that is just begin it now. If you want to do something, do it. Just because you didn't do it, it's never too late. As I say, you know, 55, I've written a book. I'm happy about that. Hopefully it comes out before I turn 56. It's on its way. I proved the final thing. It's been printed, so I will have a date. So any of you who've ordered my book, it's on its way. Um, two. <laughs> Number 32. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. That was by Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's. Now, that's assuming nothing changes. When Ray Kroc made that statement... Ray Kroc, there was, there was only, I think, KFC was the only other fast food competitor. But he said that before the likes of Hungry Jacks, before the likes of Menulog, DoorDash, any of that sort of stuff. So assuming nothing changes, that's assuming that if you always did what you always do or have always done, you'll always get what you always got. Now, that's not true. Similarly, if I always did what I always done, I always get what I always, you know, you know where I'm going with this, if muscle mass decreases by certain percentages over the years and keep building on your muscle mass so that whatever the decrease is, is a percentage of a larger mass rather than a smaller mass. Doing nothing ends in tears. If you smoke and drink and exercise, you will live longer than somebody who doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, but doesn't exercise. It's just a given. Number 33, we have two lives, Confucius said, and we start living the second life when we realize we only have one. Um, that was something I had said to my father when he gave me a big lecture on eternity. And I was questioning not necessarily my belief system, but some of the, 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 the ways in which I was brought up, which were kind of putting barricades on decisions I needed to make in life that you only get one life and that life does belong to you. You can share it with others. You can invest it in other people as well. But the idea of um, living your life for other people, that's martyrdom. And I think the days of martyrdom are over as far as dying for a cause is concerned. Sure, if somebody said to me, would you take a bullet for your children? I would. 
but I make damn sure that my children were going to do something with that life before I took a bullet for them. Um, when somebody said to me, who are you going to vote for in the yes or no vote? I said, I don't know. I'll ask my children because it has no impact on me. It has every impact on my children. And I asked them, and that's the way I voted. Number 34, true weakness in a person is recognising they have a weakness and doing nothing to correct it. That's a quote from Larry Riley. Where are the gaps in your life? What are the things you don't know that you may be thinking is okay not to know at this stage of your life? Um, I've got a motorcycle licence. Now, excuse me, I don't have a motor <laughs> motorcycle, but I didn't know how to ride a motorcycle. And I thought, hang on, if I am out in the middle of nowhere and I can't ride a motorcycle or someone needs and they can't do it, then now I know how to do that. It's one of those things. Learning to swim. If you don't know how to swim, learn how to swim. The idea of survival languages. You know, learn enough. I can say cheers in every language around the world. I can say, what is your name in every language around the world? I can say, my name is, when I say in every language, 168 uh, or so, however many languages there are in dialects. My point of it is enough to actually, you know, I mean, no matter where you are in the world, I always say, walk into an Irish pub and you'll make a friend immediately. Um, but short of that, if you're in, when in Rome, do as the Romans do and learn how to say, what's your name? Or do a birra and a porticena a popovore. Number 35, stop and smell the roses. Now, that one seems quite simple, but it was actually written by or coined that phrase by Walter Hagen, who was a golfer, and he wrote that in his autobiography in 1956. And the Beatles was the first place I heard it was stop and smell the roses. Um, but for mine, it's one of those things that, you know, we're in, we're in spring. Spring has sprung in Sydney, absolutely, cracker of a day today. But I walk along, smell the frangipanis. Smell the jasmine, smell the roses, smell the rosemary. Smell is one of those things that is determined and is connected to your memory. The different ways in which the, the what they call the retronasal olfactory, the smelling and the tasting. If you lose your sense of smell, the next thing to follow is your sense of taste. There's two things that humans have put on the planet that we love doing more than anything, and that is eating and reproducing. We love eating so that we can reproduce. <laughs> and the idea of not enjoying your food and also not being able to smell whether something's off is bad. You've got to practice those sort of things. As I like to say, your 88-year-old self will thank, <coughs> excuse me, your 88-year-old self will thank whoever old you are now self for stopping and smelling the roses because your 88-year-old self will remember that how your old, old you are now self stopped and smelled the roses because you stopped and smelled the roses. Number, oops, that's the very last one. Number 36, life's about meaning and memories. Dr. Zeus said, you never know the meaning of a moment until it becomes a memory. I say life's about meaning and memories. You create the meaning through the memories and the memories through the meaning. What meaning are you giving to the things that you're doing? When I ask you, is what you're doing right now moving you towards or away from what your goals in life are? And Marie Kondo, the minimalist uh, woman who helps you get rid of things, says when you pick something up and ask, does this bring me joy? And if the answer is no, then get rid of it. Uh, a mate of mine who owned a bar gave me about 50 of these things, and I've only recently <laughs> realised it takes up so much cupboard space in my place. My um, daughters and their boyfriends, we went out for dinner on my birthday, and I we had three of these, my, myself and my two, uh, the, the boys, I thought, wow, I think it's the first time I've used more than one of these in however long it was. Um, but it was about creating the memories and the meaning. So the meaning I'll put to that is I'll keep six and I'll get rid of the others. But the other thing about it is the meaning that you associate with things and the more meaning you put into your behaviours and the more meaning you attribute to something, the more memorable it is going to be, either good or bad. And Shakespeare said nothing's either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And the way dinner the other night when I didn't get the seat I wanted and I was being pouty, what the meaning I was giving to a situation, I was losing state and the state of mind of being present. And I, I, this, I didn't make this up. If you think of what you have, what you lack disappears. If you think of what you lack, what you have disappears. The seat I actually did have and my daughter said, look, Dad, the sun's sitting there. You won't see it there. <clears throat> they sold me on 
feeling good. But what they sold me on was a memory that I was about to dash. I was about to ruin a great memory with my children by being a ding ding. Anyway, um, next up, number 37. Excuse me, very hot day in Sydney today. Um, there are moments when one has to choose between, my pen was running out as I was writing this, between living one's own life fully, entirely, completely, or dragging out some false shallow and degrading existence that the world in its hypocrisy demands. Oscar Wilde said that. I'll say it again very quickly. There are moments within which one has to choose between living one's life fully, entirely, completely, or dragging out some false, shallow, degrading existence that the world in its hypocrisy demands. Now, it's about being authentic. And there was a stage in my life when I was living for other people's belief systems. I was living for other people's hypocrisy. Um, you have to learn to say no. You have to learn your own authenticity. You have to learn and practice to step up and to stand up. And stepping up is standing up. Stand up for yourself, stand up for your beliefs, and challenge those things that aren't serving, supporting, nurturing, and or sustaining you. Number 38, if you love life, you'll love time because time is what life is made up of. Bruce Lee said that. Now, my my, here's the thing. If time is my greatest commodity, and I, I guess it's yours as well, I spent a lot of money on this watch for two reasons. One, it's a kinetic watch, so when it stops, I have to rewind it again. Now, I haven't had to rewind this thing for quite some time because I wear it a lot. And the reason I'm wearing it a lot is because I'm so focused on time. And I figure the more money you spend on a watch, the more you're going to look at it. You're going to enjoy it. And you're going to be more cognizant of what time it is. And I look at this all the time. I mean, I cook. And I used to, yesterday, I, I cooked for a bunch of people. And I cooked two steaks. I put the coals down. And 10 minutes, set an alarm. 10 minutes, set an alarm. Rest 10 minutes, set an alarm. So I'm always working off timers because time is so important. And I think time is such such a, you just never get it back. You can steal all the money you like off me and I'll get that back or I should be able to get that back. But if you waste my time or steal my time, I'll never get that back and I'll resent you for that. No. So I don't let people waste my time and I certainly don't endeavour to waste any of yours. Number 39. The mind, once stretched by a new idea, can never return to its original dimensions. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that. So I think stretch past the way that you're thinking. Get outside of your comfort zone. Look into different religions. Look into different sports. Look into different ways of living your life. Stretch is one of those things as well. Stretch as often as you can. I used to say I, <clears throat> I don't believe there's more presence-based experience than meditation. But I now believe the most presence-based experience I can feel is stretching. And the idea of stretching and feeling those muscles move then reminds me to stay supple and balance and all that sort of thing. But it also is good for you. I mean, you're stretching and you're stretching the nerves. You've only got to watch a cat. Cats wake up and they stretch and pew, jump eight meters. So do some stretching and stretch yourself past. Get out of your comfort zone and adopt a growth mindset. Number 40, gratitude is the memory of the heart. Jean-Baptiste Monsieur said that. Um, an attitude of gratitude. As I say, if you go to sleep of an evening, think of three things you're really grateful for and you'll fall asleep like that from the day. So what I do is I'm heading off to sleep of an evening. I think, right, got up this morning, did that, did that, good, good. Had a great conversation with that person. Had an interesting conversation with that person. <coughs> Excuse me. I calmed myself down with that. I did this, I did that. Really grateful that I looked at that situation. I'm so appreciative of the way that person did that favour for me. Um, gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. And as I say, my father would call it an attitude of gratitude. But within that, that's how you're going to sleep well. They say the best sleeping tablet is a clear conscience. Number 41. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. That's Frederick Nietzsche again. It's one that is often quoted from, well, it is quoted within Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. So when he says, he who has a why to live for can endure or bear almost any how, I say the whys are the windows to your goals. When you set your goals, no matter what they are, why do you want to have that? If you can't give yourself a good enough reason, then it's not a goal. It's not something you want. So dash it and get on with the next thing. Number 42. Everything can be taken, again, from man's search for meaning. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, 
the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So for me, I think attitude is everything, you know, and the, the, the prisoners within those Nazi concentration camps, you could punish them, you could torture their bodies, and Viktor Frankl thought you could do all of that, but you can't punish my mind. Now, sleep. Again, it's going to come down to it when I talk about the three biggest determinants to longevity, and these are the lessons that I've learned. I have to sleep eight hours a night. And the idea of saying, okay, sleep was used as, or sleep deprivation was used as a punishment throughout the wars because they knew the detriment that it had to the brain. And the idea of saying, I'm choosing for my, the last of my human freedoms is to choose how I respond to any situation. So do you respond or do you react? and respond well. Number 43, between stimulus and response, another one. This Again, one of the, the books that I think should be mandatory reading in high schools around the world, but particularly in Australia, should be that book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's only about 160 or so pages. But there is a quote in there, between stimulus and response, there is space. Within that space lies your power to choose your response. And within your response lies your growth and your freedom. Now, that is one that I've learned so much so because the way to handle that and the way to, to make that space greater so that you respond rather than react is through meditation, is through journaling. I will say exercise is the top of the pops. That's the number one. Breathing, the physiological sigh, figure eight breathing, eternity or infinity breathing, as I call it. Eight seconds in, hold for eight seconds, eight seconds out, left, right nostril, eight times. Repeat that twice. Um, Practicing responses. So if you've ever done martial arts, they teach you carters. Yesterday I was teaching boxing. <laughs> left, left, right, uppercut, uppercut, high, high, hook, hook. <laughs> uh, what is it? Left, left, right, uppercut, uppercut, high, high, hook, hook, straight, straight, knee, knee, kick, kick, blah, blah, blah. It goes on so, so repetitively, <clears throat> excuse me, that when the attacker comes, the response is there. Similarly, rather than reacting, have responses prepared. I spoke to you about triggers. So be trigger happy rather than trigger crappy when the triggering people come along. Number 44, God helps those who help themselves. That was taken from an Aesop's fable. Benjamin Franklin also said it. Um, when I say God helps those who help themselves, when you pray, pray as though you have a thing. But when you pray, also ensure that you're doing something about it. You're not wishing, even an intention. It's something you intend to do. A resolution is something you resolve to do. Benjamin Franklin said, resolve to perform what you ought and perform without fail what you resolve. If, you've, if you have resolved that something's an important enough thing to do, then do it without fail. Uh, so when I say um, feel the feeling, so when you pray, pray as though you have a thing. Feel the feeling. When you set a goal, feel what it would feel like at the, at the uh, achievement of that goal. When I'm having discovery sessions with new clients, the first session is a discovery session. It goes for an hour, we go through things, and I'll quite often be laughing, and I have to explain. I say, listen, I've got to tell you why I'm laughing. One, laughter is my shock mechanism, but I'm not shocked by what you said, but I'm laughing because I can see and feel, I can see the text message you're going to send through and say, hey, Dave, this just happened. Thank you, man. Hey, I just put together the biggest thing in the Southern Hemisphere. Thank you. And I laugh because I can see this person's problem is so solvable. But I, as I say, I can't do it for you. The idea of catching a man a fish and he'll eat for a day, teach a man a fish and he'll fish for a lifetime. My job is to not only teach you how to fish, but to teach you how to teach people how to fish so that you fish forever and ever and ever and generationally and that you live your legacy. <clears throat> and that legacy is about longevity with energy and enthusiasm, having the generosity to be and give, the altruism, to do things philanthropically. The C is the consistency and the Y is doing it with useful youthfulness and knowing that you are enough. Number 45, between B and D, there is C. Between birth and death, there is choice. That's from Jim Quick, and he was the author of the book called Limitless. Your choices really do define who you are. You either choose to do something or you choose not to. Now, are you choosing to do something or are you preferring not to do it? When we talk about options, the best option is the option that gives you the most options. Whatever it is you choose, choose you first. Choose to do something that's going to serve you 
first so that you can be serving other people. They're the sort of things that I've learned as far as, you know, being told that I was selfish or looking after number one. It's not selfishness, it's self-preservation. All of the things that I was told in my time, I've, I've been accused of being selfish for looking after myself, yet I'd be looking after myself for three hours before anyone else I'd come across had even woken up. How selfish is that? It's not. People will tell you what they want you to hear so that they feel better about their own inadequacies. Be careful of that within friendships. Um, number 46, as a man thinketh, so he is he. That's from James Allen. Now, there is a book called As a Man Thinketh. It's a very small book. It takes about 10 minutes to read. <clears throat> but whatever you think, that's what you become. Um, and you become what you think about most of the time. You think you're a winner, you'll be a winner. You think you're a loser, you'll be a loser. You think something's going to go wrong and inevitably you will make it go wrong. You think you're going to say something stupid and inevitably you will say something stupid. But as I say, if you've done your homework and you've practiced what it is you're supposed to be doing and you know that you're good at everything that you're doing, when Sigmund Freud said anatomy is destiny, look after yourself, feel good about yourself, and you will. I, I've, I've got to warn some of my clients and say, now, you know what's going to happen here? You're going to start, you're going to have to bring your partner in on this because you're going to start feeling better about yourself. You're going to start saying, wow, girls are looking at me. You shouldn't have to be thinking girls are looking at you. Your partner should be looking at you and applauding you on how well you're looking after yourself. And that should be the ultimate goal. Number 47. I'm sure I've told you to drink 30 mils of water for every kilo of body weight. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Napoleon Hill, the author of Think and Grow Rich, said that. Now, my thing is don't dream small. Don't aim low. The expression, if you aim for the stars, you might hit the moon. No, aim for the stars and hit the stars. Don't be thinking, well, if I do that, I, you know, I, I, I set however many New Year's resolutions every single year. And there was a while there where I used to think to myself, well, I set 20 and I only achieved 10, but that's 10 more than I achieved if I only set one and didn't do it. And I told myself that for quite some time. Now, every single resolution I resolve, and I do them daily, I make sure I hit them because I'm not going to aim low. I'm not, I, there's, there's an idea of cutting yourself some slack and going easy on yourself. You know, when I talk about my 8,000 calorie blowout, it's a treat day. It's not a cheat day because I plan to do that. Cheating is where I stick my finger down my throat and try and vomit it all up like they used to do in the Roman days. That's cheating. That's actually gluttony and it's a, it's a mental condition. Um, number 48, comes to the time. I'm getting through this hopefully pretty well. Success is not to be pursued. It is to be attracted by the person you become. Jim Rohn said that. Now, I always say goal setting is clues that you leave for your future self. And when you look back as an 88-year-old, 95-year-old, 105, however old, when you, as you look back in your life, you will look back on all the goals that you achieved as little breadcrumb trails for you as an adult, as the, when I say an adult, <laughs> I, I've got this Peter Pan mentality. Um, until somebody tells me how old I am, I don't think I'm as old as I'm supposed to be, uh, you know, to be called Peter Pan. When my alarm is forever young, you know, Peter Pan does. He's the child. He's I'm immature and I don't care. And I want people to call. They've been calling me immature. Now they kind of can't get away with it. They call me immature and I may behave immaturely, but I'm getting on in years where the immaturity label just doesn't stick and I don't care because for me, I feel young, and that's the point. I don't want to be old. When I find I've gone a few days and I'm not laughing as much, that's when I think to myself, what's going on? You know. And so it's not so much the goals that you set but who you become in the pursuit of those goals. But always leave yourself a bit of leeway to have a bit of fun, to stop and smell the roses, to have your blowouts, to laugh, to watch a bit of stupidity, to you know, scroll on your, your silly social medias or whatever they are. Limit it. But also cut yourself some slack and give yourself some leeway. The word leeway actually means that little bit, it's a nautical term, that little bit off course. The word leeward is bringing you back on course. So I could call my business leeward, mind and body mastery, but leeway, I think you just need to cut yourself some slack. And that's another lesson that I've learned over those years. Number 49, let us prepare our minds as if we come to the very end of life. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's books each day. The one who puts the finishing touches on each day 
is never short of time. That's a Seneca quote. It's one that I have on my fridge. It's one that I put at the beginning of my journals. It's it's one that I I think is really, really important. The night journaling is turning the to-do list into the to-da list. It's reviewing each day and knowing that I gave a good account of myself. Um, I said to somebody today, I was out here and there was a stranger in the backyard and they're asking whose property it was and all that sort of business and why are you the only one out here? I've seen you out here. I live up there, the only person who's ever out here. And I said, I don't know. But memento more. if I died today, would I be happy with the last day I had on the planet? Now, I would, and I would on every day because I make sure I don't waste a second. And none of us are guaranteed the next day. You know, obviously everything I'm doing is to make sure I do wake up the next day. But even on my 55th birthday, when I woke up and I had this, I'm alive, 55, wait a you know, very, very happy about that. But then as I journal and I think to myself, well, what I'm about to do today is everything I need to do today to live to 105, 110. And then of an evening, when I put the finishing touches on that day and I go through my ritual and I do all these sort of things, then I'm going to make sure that I get to the finishing line in good stead. Number 50, there's nothing stable in human affairs. Therefore, avoid undue elation in times of adversity, nor undue, in prosperity rather. I'll read it. There's nothing stable in human affairs. Therefore, avoid undue elation in times of prosperity, nor undue depression in times of adversity. Socrates said that uh, when I was a kid, I used to say, you know, we had the good books and the bad books. And I used to say, you're either in the good books or the bad books. You're neither in either of them for very long. So you may as well just live your life the way you want to live it. Not being reckless, not breaking rules. Arnold Schwarzenegger says, break the rules, don't break the law. <clears throat> I never did. I've never been involved in criminal activity, but I've broken a lot of rules. Uh, I was only amusing the other day through COVID. COVID's one of those things we can look back on, and it costs some people a lot of their life uh, in as much as how much time they feel they wasted. There are people who feel that they feel really ripped off and are still trying to recover from that time. I look at it, I remember being on the beach drinking, you know, Coronas with Mexican takeaways, the police were going above and, you know, and it's like the Gestapo. But I didn't let that that go and people came to my house and they sat one door length apart from me on that end and they bought their beers and I bought mine and we didn't touch each other. And But I didn't let it get in the way of socialisation. Occasionally there was more than one person in the house. You know what I mean? And to me it, it just, just seemed stupid and mindless if that was going to be the last day of my life, would I have been up happy living in, you know, to the rules? That I wasn't, as I say, I wasn't reckless and I wasn't silly. Number 51, failure is planning to fail. And that's it. <laughs> failure is planning to fail. No, sorry. The, his original one was, this is Benjamin Franklin, failure is planning to fail. But planning to fail is failing to plan is where I've taken that one on. And that basically comes down to knowing what your purpose is. And your purpose is having a plan. What is your plan in your mental, physical, spiritual, social, financial, family, business, and romance? What's your plan? Understand what is it that is unique about you. Review where you've set goals in the past and gone off them. Reframe the way you're looking at a situation. Make it good if you're thinking at it bad. John Milton said, some people can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Are you looking at the world in a way that you need to reframe? Reset those goals and renew those goals. Who are the people? Have a plan for how you spend your time with people. Be optimistic about your plan. Have a structure to what your plan is. And then have a plan that is effective, that is absolutely the most effective use of your time in that way. Number 52, in everything you do, begin with the end in mind. The Latin expression for that would be premeditatio malorum, the, the premeditation of evils that may lie ahead. Now, Idris Shah, I got that out of a book called The Caravan of Dreams. It was written in 1968. Um, and the story basically goes, there was a king being carried along by a bunch of people, by his men, and a wise old Sufi on the side of the road said, I'll give you 100 denarii, or whatever the currency of the day was, if, you know, for, and I'll give you, you give me 100 denarii rather, I'll give you a bit of advice that'll save your life. The king was bored. He said, okay, what is it? He said, in everything you do, begin with the end in mind. And the king threw the, the fellow, the wise old Sufi, the hundred denarii, and off he went. And he went back to the palace and he had that inscribed all over the walls and over his royal everything. Anyway, years later, the physician was, uh, the royal physician who was 
lancing the blood. That's, they used to do bloodletting back in those days. He had been bribed to actually poison the lance and kill the king. And as they put his royal dish in front of him, he sees inscribed on the top, in everything you do, begin with the end in mind. <laughs> he starts to shake and get a bit nervous. The king goes, what's going on? Told him what was happening and it saved the king's life and obviously he did away with the plotters. Uh, I walked into my daughter's bedroom one day, she's about 15 or 16, and I said, Madeline, Madeline, what have I always told you? And she said, in everything, she just woke up, in everything you do, begin with the end in mind. I said, that's fantastic. Yes, I have. But I also said, begin with the end in mind. Don't leave your brows on the ground. Your mother's going to see those and hit the roof. Number 53, getting in to the final, every man is two men. The man he is and the man he would like to be. William Feather says that. Now, I worked on Men's Fitness Magazine for six years. I got the chance to interview greatest athletes across every single physical. I met a couple of prime ministers. I met leaders of industry, and it was all around their creation of products. I tried all of their supplements. I tried all of their training gear. I did CrossFit, kettlebell, everything. I got all of those sort of things out of that. One of the things that I noticed that the number one thing that all of our readers they would buy the tagline on the cover, six weeks to abs, this, this, and it was the man they wanted to be. And that's what it is. I might have said it a few weeks ago that hell is who you, when you, on the day that you die, meeting the person you could have become as you are now. So every man is two men, the man he is and the man he has the potential to be. So what you should be focusing on is your potential. As I say, petrol has potential. Till the spark hits it, the car is, is stationary or immobile. Number 54. A good laugh, excuse me, a good laugh and a long sleep are the best cures in the doctor's book. That's an Irish proverb, eight hours sleep. It's pretty much non-negotiable. Unless you're the parent of a toddler, you need to get eight hours sleep. You should prioritise sleep above all else. Um, I'm, a, I'm a good one for catching naps and catching up on sleep, uh, timing the sleeps that I have. I can have calls with people in the UK or in, in different areas in the US, and I might have to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to have that call. And it finishes on 3, and I'll get back to sleep. Now, I, I wouldn't be taking stimulants. Again, coffee is not one of those things that increases your adrenaline. It just closes your adenosine receptors, which are the things that make you tired. So I have had a coffee before I started here tonight, and I had that one hour before because it takes an hour before caffeine kicks in. People say, oh, don't talk to me until I've had my coffee. It takes about an hour for the effects of caffeine to kick in. <clears throat> caffeine has a half-life of six hours. So that cup of coffee that I had, the 80 milligrams of caffeine, will still be with me you know, in six hours' time, but it doesn't have that effect on me and as much as I can actually sleep because I pretty much do put so much into each day that I'm buggered and I sleep quite well. But think about it this way. If you're the sort of person who's only sleeping six hours a night, that is 75% of your eight hours that you should be sleeping. Now, they say we spend a third of our life sleeping. A third of our day is eight hours. A third of our life is, off the course of 85, is 65, or rather 20 years that you're going to cut short of your life. The retirement age in this country is 65. You work all your life sleeping six hours, working for the man, putting that badge of I'm a, you know, I'm a workaholic and I work how many hours? For what? You know, you retire on the in those days and that's what happens. At the end of the day, you retire to a, you know, diet of mashed bananas and sour grapes or prunes. My brother had a good one. You think the bottom's falling out of your world? Eat prunes and see the world fall out of your bottom. Number 55, number 55, the last one. Thanks for staying up with me here. No man is free who is not master of himself. That's from Socrates. And that is the pretty much the quote that I closed my book on. And it's one of those quotes. I had it on my wall of my sauna for 20 years. What do you have to do to be who you want to be, to have what you want to have? Do, be, have, do, behave. No man is free who is not master of himself. So with that, gentlemen, um, I, I'll tell you what I have done. I did create a... Program, I uh, it'll from the 7th of November, there'll be 55 days till the brand new year, till January 20, till January the 1st, 2024, 55 days before that. And I have a 55 day program, it's essentially eight weeks 
It starts off day one with a one-hour, one-on-one coaching session with me <clears throat> where we go through a discovery session. And through that discovery, we'll talk through what it is you want to achieve in your mental, physical, spiritual, social, financial, family, business, and romantic life. From that, we'll set a goal and off we'll go. You get a daily email from me. You get a daily text from me. And once a week, we get a 15-minute check-in where we go through everything that you're going through. Throughout the course of those eight weeks, we'll have three one-on-one coaching sessions. My hourly rate, doesn't matter what it is, but I'm offering this program. If any of you guys want that, generally I don't talk price. I don't advertise my products and all that sort of thing. My six-week coaching program, which is one hour coaching for six weeks, is $6,000. I'm doing the 55-day program where you get all of that plus other stuff, four workouts sent to you a week, a meal plan, a workout, what your total daily energy expenditure is. If you have a goal weight or a goal physique, I'll talk you through that as well, and I'll agree on it, and I'll hold you accountable. I'm doing that for $3,000, $1,500 down to get in the game as far as the deposit, and then after the 55 days, once you've achieved everything, you pay the remaining $1,500. Now, if after that 55 days you don't believe that you got what I promised, you would get, and we agreed on at the beginning, you don't have to pay me the other $1,500 and you get the original $1,500 back. So my point of it is 55 days of daily interaction with me and that coaching into what I've learned in 55 years. You get an opportunity to ask me questions as well because that's what does happen in my coaching sessions. But I offer that to you because you are HPFers at 55% off, or 50% off rather, uh, off my six-week course for 55 days. If you want any more information, david at leeway.com.au. Love to have you uh, on board because that's all I want to do. From now till New Year, all I want to do is coach because I'm finding I have a lot of time on my hands because I'm not writing and I'm just waiting for this book. It'll be out in a couple of weeks at the very least, the very uh, latest. Um, but I'd love that opportunity to meet you guys in person and do that if you can. David at leeway.com.au. Let's get on a call, book you in. Starts 7th of November. That also includes a one-hour webinar weekly where it'll be a QA, and a but I do one of these specifically for the people doing the 55 days uh, program. With that, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, happy birthday to me, from me, to you. Have a great night and be well.